Okay. So welcome back to CE528. So this is relevant to your last sort of lab assignment, which is about practical application of how do we do economics of resilience? How do we do economic analysis of a resilience type project? Now, I'm gonna give you some background on this. Um, and that's, that's what we're doing here is, is trying to give you a basic brief background of what, what the economics of resilience is about. And, you know, our infrastructure is facing a lot of challenges because, because obviously we, as we talked about, there's shortfall of funding, but the challenges are greater as well. Our infrastructure is becoming old. A lot of the, you know, roadway and transit infrastructure was built a long time ago. And it's time for an upgrade just because of the age of the infrastructure, but also we have more sort of severe climate events that are happening as well. And obviously, you know, there is one argument to be made about like, you know, how we can reduce uh, climate change. And, and, and that's obviously, you know, a parallel track, but while climate change is happening, while these events are underway, we have to also protect our infrastructure, regardless of whether or not we are able to curb climate change or, or make any you know, changes to these disastrous event patterns or not. We have to sort of ensure that our infrastructure remains in place as we encounter more and more disasters. So in, in that way, this lecture first is gonna give you a background of what kind of challenge our infrastructure is facing right now and how can we make it more resilient? If you are the leader, if you are the leader of a DOT, for example, uh, or a key decision-making position, how can you make a case, an economic case to make the transportation infrastructure more resilient and then we're going to do talk about a specific example of what we can do in case of an airport and how can we make the airport more resilient and less prone to flooding okay so that we are not dealing with a lot of delays and so forth okay so first a broader case for the resilience issue that our infrastructure is facing and how we can make an economic case for protecting the infrastructure and then a specific example of airport resilience and an assignment for you where you actually do a benefit cost analysis under a Monte Carlo simulation scenario where you evaluate uh, you know different uh, different uh, uh, scenarios okay so this lecture is based on uh, a project that I worked on uh, a couple uh, maybe a year year ago I think maybe a year and a half ago with my team at, uh, so Dr. John Rene at uh, Florida Atlantic, Dr. Brian Volshan at Louisiana State, Dr. Pam Marie Tite at, uh, um, at uh, Clemson University and Carl Kim and Eric Yamashita, Dr. Carl Kim and Eric Yamashita at, uh, at University of Hawaii. And then we, this, this project was led by Deborah Matherly and the Louis Berger, but they're the big consulting company. And then this was the, a National Cooperative Highway Research Program project. And um, 2055 was the number of the project. And that project was about how leaders of transportation agencies, like DOT CEOs, how can they sell making investments for resilience? Okay, so, so how can they make an economic case for funding resilience infrastructure? So first thing we wanted to do was talk about what this resilience is, right? And why is it important, right? So Ashto's uh, defines the resi resilience as prepare and plan for and absorb and recover from and more successfully adapt to adverse events, right? So, so how can we bounce back? How can our infrastructure bounce back from adverse events? The history of the term resilience in the mid 90s in the context of seismic event risk uh, 
hurricanes of mid 2000s. So, so initially, the term resilience in the context of transportation infrastructure originated right here in California because we had this big earthquake in the mid 90s. They were worried about these big earthquake events. We still are, of course. But, but how do we make infrastructure resilience to that earthquake risk? So that's where the idea of resilience infrastructure started in the context of the seismic events. And then after 9 11 and the hurricanes in the mid 2000s, you know, the resilience became a sort of a broader all hazard term. Okay, it became a more sort of all hazard type term. And then, so your context of resilience suddenly became very broad. So instead of narrow focus on seismic event, where only California and maybe Oregon and, and Washington were worried about it, just on the West Coast, basically they took it seriously because what happened on 9 11 in 2001, and then what happened in Hurricane Katrina and Rita in mid 2000s. So then resilience became this okay, we need to deal with multiple hazards depending upon where you are in the country. So the current paradigm and the Scott SEM, the ASHTOS, a strategic goal involves advocating for the role of all hazard infrastructure production and emergency management in a resilience transportation system. So we want to now protect all of our infrastructure. Okay? So for the state agencies, what does that mean? That means that we have sort of three distinct viewpoints about planning, engineering, and operations. So when we define resilience, we can define it in the context of planning. So climate change and sustainability will come into play there. In terms of engineering, infrastructure protection. So I think what you're gonna be doing in, in the lab assignment that I'm gonna have, so that's gonna be related to more engineering type stuff where you're engaging in what we call the infrastructure protection and you're trying to make an economic case for it. Okay, so, so that your lab assignment will deal with, uh, uh, with engineering a uh, piece of it, but you could, you could certainly make the case during planning and operation. You have three strategic levers, policy, people, and programs. So maybe policy would advice would be like, you know, broader policy mandates. And then you can, you can look at people like, you know, making sure that you have personnel in place who are responsible for this stuff. So having, you know, a, a resilience uh, team in your, in, in your organization is important. And broadly in those positions, you have people that, that take that challenge seriously. And then specific programs in place as well. So, so sort of programmatically related improvement. So, so putting the, together programs in place. So policy sort of flows from the top. You hire the right people that can implement those policies and then develop some program level things at the regional scale. So th those are sort of your three strategic levers. And then you could focus on the system, the overall system. But then you can also focus on the infrastructure component itself as well. And again, you know, when you're talking about the engineering piece of it in the viewpoints, um, you know, arena, you're dealing with a lot of times you're dealing with components and that's what your lab assignment is about. You're going to deal with the airport runway as a specific infrastructure component. And then there are two different time periods of research interest. That's pre-event where you're dealing with risk reduction and post event where you're dealing with consequence reduction, okay? So understanding of transportation resilience at 2016. So this is from, all of this is from a 2016 to 2018 uh, roadmap, uh, something that was put out by TRB in, in 2016. So what are some of the lessons from the literature here and how we define resilience? What we noticed was that over time, the term resilience is appearing more and more into the planning documents, okay? Agencies need to be clear about the purpose of the term resilience. So, so when you're using the term resilience, you have to be very precise with what you mean by that. Is that, you know, if the term resilience is being used to create an analytical framework to preserve the existing system, 
Are you using the term resilience to identify ways to modify those systems? Or you're trying to do a mechanism to start uh, a new system, okay? So that's, that's really very important here. And then preservation of existing system with minor changes may, may, may reduce long-term resiliency. So this is another sort of very sort of controversial idea, this last bullet here. So this last bullet, I want to pay attention to that. Because this, the lesson here was that our existing infrastructure is not very resilient to begin with, right? And it's not very conducive to us doing more resilient stuff in the long run. And, and that's, that's a problem, okay? So, so if you try to tinker around the edges and make those minor changes to the existing system, you might be reinforcing an infrastructure that reduces the long-term resilience. So I think when you, especially when the planning and program level, you might want to change. You might want to plan for bigger changes in the infrastructure so that you're, res, you're increasing resilience for the long-term and not just trying to, so, so not just sort of, like kind of just doing this bouncing back to the existing levels, you might want to like have more, a little bit more of a fundamental transformation, a transformation to your infrastructure so that you're achieving that long-term resilience. So, and then there are different questions that come into play. So one of the lessons that we learned was that, you know, cybersecurity and terrorism related. Uh, so as you sort of move towards more intelligent infrastructure, more automated transportation, maybe some automated transit and stuff like that, you want to make sure that your infrastructure is protected from uh, terrorism and cyber attacks. It's a forthcoming challenge to state DOTs. You know, we are transit tra transitioning to more automated infrastructure. You know, we might have buses that sort of you know are are on the track, or maybe, but these are good targets because they can, because they're high density. They they make a more vulnerable target for 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 terrorism type attacks. And if you're relying on the automated systems, there might be hackers that, get, that can get involved and, and, and so on and so forth. So it's an emerging area of, uh, you know, it's an emerging area of, of concern in, in terms of resilience, but something that will be, become important as we move towards more automated infrastructure. So, so as, we make, as we make our infrastructure more intelligent, we have to keep an eye that we are making sure that that infrastructure is secure from cyber terrorism. And then extreme weather events, you know, so, so we, what we used to think of extreme events, they're becoming more and more common. You know, if you look at the billion dollar infrastructure disasters, you know, that caused at least $1 billion damage in 2017, we had so many of these. I mean, having, if you look at these counts here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, there are 15 events per year, at least in 2017, that led to at least a billion dollars worth of infrastructure damage, right? So, I mean, if there are 15 of them every year, more than once a month, I mean, to, to some extent, they're not even extreme, right? They're becoming more and more extreme or more and more mainstream weather events. So what you need to do is maybe you need to plan for them and make your infrastructure more resilient because what we used to think of those extreme weather events, they're not extreme anymore. They're happening with more and more frequency. So here is a framework, risk and resilience analysis framework uh, that has been developed, uh, adapted by one of the DOTs in Colorado. Colorado DOT has adapted that for their highway systems. And, and that one is about asset, threat, consequence, vulnerability, threat assessment, risk resilience assessment, and then risk resilience management. So you make sure what assets do I have and which are the most critical ones? And then what threats and hazards should I consider? What is going to be the consequence of each of these threats and hazards? And then you look at where my most vulnerable infrastructure is. 
And then you look at the threats and what is the likelihood that a terrorist natural hazard or dependency self locational hazard would strike my facility. And then you, based on that, you define the risk as consequences times vulnerability times threat. So that defines the risk. So if you have, so for a location where all these three things are higher, you know, that means your infrastructure is at the highest risk. And then your resilience will be dependent upon your dollar impact, your vulnerability, and your threat. So when those three things are higher, that's where you want to spend most of your resilience dollars. Okay, where your service outage has the most dollar impact and where your infrastructure is most vulnerable and the threat is the highest, that's where you look at the resilience. And then that's where your resilience dollars ought to go. And, and once that we do that, what options do I have to reduce the risk and resilience at those locations? How much will each benefit in reduced risk and increased resilience? How much would it cost? What's the benefit cost ratio of my options? And again, we'll see that in the context of an airport runway in our lab assignment. But sort of this is one way of doing that. And if you, and then if you look at Colorado DOT, they, they had these extreme floods in 2013. And then they adopted that framework in 2017 to do just this. And, and, you know, and they've adopted it. And, and that's a good framework for a DOT to look at. So, but here's the, so why is that framework so important? Because the resource allocation follows needs. So the need for resiliency planning has to be recognized and integrated into planning for more frequently and routinely occurring conditions. You know, in the resource allocation context, there are two questions that you're gonna, you're gonna ask yourself. What factors build up resilience? And what are the efficiency implications of those factors? And then this is the, this is the problem, right? The problem is, if you're gonna have resilience built into your infrastructure, if you wanna have resilience built into your infrastructure, you're essentially sacrificing a bit of uh, what I would call efficiency, right? Because if you're doing resilience, to do resilience, a lot of times you need what we call redundancy. You need extra, you need some things that are not gonna be always used. So sometimes people who are more efficiency focused, they might say, What's the point of building redundancy? Why, are, why do we have redundancy here? And people don't like redundancy. You know? People don't like to have redundancy, redundant, redundant infrastructure because that's not efficient. But oftentimes that's exactly what you need for resilience. So that if one thing fails, you have something else to fall back on, right? So that's your challenge is like, no, you're, when you try to build up resilience, your efficiency oftentimes has a trade-off alongside it and efficiency goes down, right? So that's one issue. But you have to think about how efficient are your status quo to begin with, you know, is, you know, not having this redundancy, are you actually leaving your infrastructure vulnerable because these disaster events are happening more and more often nowadays. So maybe your infrastructure that you're built, relying on efficiency is not very efficient to begin with. And then one sort of example from, from this is, uh, you know, these, this just in time type warehousing stuff, right? You know, we, a lot of these companies have very efficient way of delivering pro products. To, from warehouses to the stores and all that. And that was nice while it lasted, but now that we are having these supply chain challenges, those companies that rely on that are facing the most trouble. You know, so, so that's kind of one thing to think about is that if you don't have redundancy in the system. If you have a disaster event happen, then, then you, might, might be, you might be hanging because you don't have enough redundancy in the system. And that means you don't have enough resilience in your system. Moving resilience programs and project into prioritizes is challenging because you don't have enough data and tools and guidance. 
So maybe having more guidance around that is, is important. Uh, and Money et al. 2017, they developed a decision support spreadsheet tool to help value resilience-based costs and benefits. And you can see that the project, the specific lab project that you're going to talk about that, that tries to get at that exact issue where I'm going to show you a tool that can help you prioritize resilience because you will be able to get the exact sense of the benefit cost ratio for your, uh, for your resilience related funding. Trade disruptions have large social and economic impacts. To accurately measure cost, resilience planning needs to consider freight systems. And again, we are seeing that right now. We have a truck driver shortage, and that's having a major ripple effect through the economy. And, but I think when we talk about resilience, we don't have good tools to incorporate the freight systems in our cost and benefit analysis. So that's another thing that we need to consider. So, so here are some key outcomes from, from this work uh, that we had. There is social cost of disasters, uh, physical damage to the infrastructure. What breaks is typically a piece of infrastructure, but what's impacted is the social coordinators that depends on that infrastructure. So, you know, people not being able to go to work, people not being able to see their friends and family, people not being able to get the stuff that they need. It's a bigger social cost than just the physical damage to the infrastructure. The infrastructure ultimately will get fixed, but people will have disastrous outcomes. So you have to look at those social costs. Routinely integrating resilience into project planning will take a cultural shift, but I think overall, it will be more cost-effective over time. And where, where in the key, key processes, what are some of the key processes that we need to address? The Long Range Transportation Plan, LRTP, and then the State Transportation Improvement Program, STIP. Those are sort of your key agency processes where, where it makes the most difference. So, uh, so, so what you want to do is take the long range transportation plan and the state transportation improvement plan the program. So there are key agency processes that every DOT has. And if you can get resilience sort of integrated within those plans and programs, then you have a greater chance of making progress towards making our infrastructure more sort of resilient. Yeah. Um, so some more key, key things there is that agencies need to be more precise in what they, are, what they mean by resilience. And specifically, they shouldn't target sort of just, you know, tinkering around the edges and bring the infrastructure back to what it used to be, but maybe making some long run, having some more long range redundancy built into the infrastructure so that we can do that. And then major development. And so, so the, this is the last item is critical because if you, track the history of how we build resilience into our infrastructure. Sadly, that happens after a bad thing already happens. So, so for example, after what happened during Hurricane Katrina, where we could not evacuate enough people, we started focusing on, okay, we need to figure out how do we evacuate people from a vulnerable region in, in, in Hurricane. After 9-11, same thing. Is our infrastructure, uh, you know, terrorism safe? Uh, you know, so those kind of things happen after a major disaster. So I hope, especially with regards to cyber terrorism, for example, as we are moving towards these automated infrastructure, I hope we don't wait for a big disruptive sort of cyber attack before we build that resiliency into our infrastructure. So, so even though resilience is supposed to be this forward-looking arena of work, making our infrastructure more resilient, but if you look at our past history, we always do things after something bad really happens. So I hope we can change that and, and our build in our processes, build in resiliency so that we can protect our infrastructure in the first place. Okay. So that sort of is the big picture issue of resilience and economics of resilience and why it's so hard to do resilience. Uh, and now what I want to do is I want to talk another 
sort of uh, cooperative research program project, this time re relevant for airport infrastructure. And I want to do a precise thing about uh, what I'm doing here is I'm making you familiar with, with one specific aspect of resilience and how we can do economic analysis around that. So first of all, I would invite any questions you might have about the bigger picture of the infrastructure resilience. 